Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be a really interesting talk, if I have to say so myself. And this was a talk I gave at the um, end of December NDIS meeting in Orlando, an excellent meeting every December after RSNA. And we were speaking to the audience about AI and how it's going to impact them. So the talk is not really going into the real details of AI, how you do algorithms or things like that, but really the audience, which for the most part was mainly private practice people, the question really was, how is AI going to affect them in practice? And so I came up with this really, I think, novel title, Is It the End of Organized Radiology? How is AI going to impact what we do? So I said, look, let me give you some conclusions before I even start my talk. The future of medicine is AI. The future of patient care is AI. The future of medicine is dependent on how we use AI for good and avoid some of the potential problems. And the question is no longer if, but when. Now this talk was December. I'm recording this lecture maybe two months later, early February. And I'm going to tell you that these statements, these four statements, are more true now than ever. Just in two months, the amount of changes in AI, chat GPT, and everything else is just astounding. So I think one thing you have to remember is the speed of change is just incredible. And that's something that we're going to see for a couple of years, surely. Now, I think it's a critical moment in time. The success of AI will depend on the cooperation of academics and the world leaders in AI, be it Microsoft, Google, Nvidia, Apple, you name it. And in fact, we are working closely with Microsoft on AI for good, working on the early detection of pancreatic cancer. And I will tell you, because I did it already, by the time you listen to this talk, an interview with me by Trevor Noah, yes, Trevor Noah, on the role of AI in the early detection of pancreatic cancer will be released. I think it's going to be released February 15th, on or about that date. So by the time you listen to this talk, you probably will have seen my uh, interview with Trevor Noah. If not, take a look at it. And I mentioned this point, which I think they edited out. At least I mentioned the names of the companies, but I think they cut them out. Academic has the problems to that, and the companies have the solutions. Neither will succeed without the other, and that indeed is very important. Things like ChatGPT, we're at the point where change seems to be in or near real time. The opportunity is not limited to discussions in journals like New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA or Radiology, but every day, New York Times, Forbes, Fortune, Time, Every magazine is speaking about what's going on. ChatGPT 4.0, just yesterday, um, Google announced their newest uh, ChatGPT type thing, which is called Gemini. Remember, that's what was barred. Now it's Gemini. And so one of the important things about AI is, although we wonder how patients are going to deal with AI, and that's an important question, they are dealing with AI on a daily basis because AI is not limited to medicine. It basically impacts everything they do. And a lot of our patients will be using things like ChatGPT at work or at home. Now, artificial intelligence, one of its key opportunities is in the earlier detection of cancer. And work's been done on breast cancer and lung cancer and colon cancer and many others. And we're going to focus, at least I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've done in pancreatic cancer. There will be another lecture, a lecture I gave to the Lust Garden Foundation, which funds a lot of our work on pancreatic cancer. I'll be doing that and you'll be listening to that as well in the near term. But let me just tell you some things. 40% of pancreatic tumors under two centimeters are missed. That means they're there, but it's missed. If we only can pick up those lesions, those are the patients who are often resectable. Remember that 85% of patients at time of presentation are not resectable, the tumor's too large. But if you're picking up two centimeters or less, you're going to have, instead of survival of 11 to 13%, the latest number is 13% perhaps, but you could reach 60%. So it's not inconsequential. 
Now, the thing about early detection is we need to figure out a way of picking up tumors early without overcalling because one of the challenges with looking, whether it's AI or just you and me on our own, is if you're looking for very tiny lesions, what if you start calling a lot of things that aren't lesions? You get biopsy and surgery and all sorts of complications that aren't necessary. So it's really a challenge to basically do the good without doing the bad. So with pancreatic cancer, the things we think about are earlier detection of tumors, better identification, more accurate definition of patient management, and I'll speak about that as well, better selection of chemotherapy, and perhaps better drug discovery. So we think about AI and pancreatic cancer, it's not just in radiology, it's in pathology, it's in oncology, it's in pharmacology, in discovery, in management, and in interpretation. And some of the work we did in the past was basically, you can see here, here's an image of a normal pancreas, annotation is one of us drawing it, and the prediction is by the computer, basically a one-to-one, -one. and the ability to segment multiple organs. We did this work, others have done other work. There's a segmenter article in radiology at the end of 2023 that showed very good results on multi-organ segmentation. It's my belief and always has been from the beginning that to really be able to find the pancreas well, you need to be able to define all the various organs. And if you look at this case, it's a nice example of showing you a mass in the body of the pancreas, dilated pancreatic duct, and the gland itself. So again, the computer has to find the gland and find the presence of pathology, nicely shown here. And one thing we also work on is since we know that often we'll see a pancreatic duct and that's kind of the earliest sign of early pancreatic cancer, you may not see the mass. We've also trained the computer to recognize the pancreatic duct as a way of helping to detect early pancreatic cancer. So again, if you think about it, the way you train the computer is the way you train a radiologist, teaching them what they need to know, showing them examples, but hopefully the computer will look at more examples and will be better than just a radiologist. Another part of AI is radiomics, which is the extraction of mineable high dimensional data from radiology images. And this has been applied in oncology and outside of oncology. The thing about radiomics is that it's trying to read the zeros and ones in the CT scan and provide useful information about tumor biology, behavior, and pathophysiology that you can't see any other way. So can we pick up tumors earlier? Can we determine the aggressiveness of tumors? Who needs surgery? Who doesn't need surgery? Are all some of the things. In this article by Shore, it explained how we look at the images, we segment out the pancreas or whatever organ you're interested in. You look at feature extraction, and then you figure out what features are most important in arriving at the information and diagnosis you need, and then building a model and then evaluating performance. We published this article, Linda Chu, several years ago that basically showed our ability to distinguish a patient with pancreatic cancer from normal was in the high 90% range. What you can see here in this example is the fact that a normal pancreas has a different radiomic signature. So in some sense, we're thinking about fingerprints, a fingerprint of a patient that shows the patient must have pancreatic cancer. And in this article by Chu, the use of radiomics, look at the sensitivity 100%, specificity 98.5, and accuracy of 99.2. And there've been several other articles that have shown similar numbers. Now, the way we think about things to really do the best of the best is you need to combine deep learning with radiomics, the ability to determine who has tumors even when they're not visible, and then find those tumors with AI and combine everything together, we believe is the ideal way of getting this work done. Now, in terms of radiomics, there was an article from Mayo Clinic this past year talking about detecting cancer on pre-diagnostic scans. Now, what's a pre-diagnostic scan? If you have abdominal pain and we do a CT scan and we find a pancreatic mass, that's just a diagnostic scan. But what if two years ago you had a 
CT of the abdomen because you had trauma or you had hematuria and the pancreas is in the scan. One of the things they found is that radiologists, even retrospectively, two years ago, three years ago, may not see a tumor in the pancreas, but radiomics can say there's a tumor present. And this radiomics-based machine learning can detect pancreatic cancer on pre-diagnostic CT, leading to a substantial lead in diagnosis. So we always talk about pancreatic cancer. You find today, tomorrow you have pancreatic cancer. Well, the answer is no. You may not see the cancer, but is there perhaps two or three years earlier, and this pre-diagnostic testing with radiomics may prove very valuable. In the article by Mujerji, radiomics-based machine learning models can detect pancreatic adenocarcinoma from normal pancreas when it is beyond human interrogation capability at a substantial lead time before clinical diagnosis. Prospective validation and integration of such models with potentially fluid-based biomarkers may allow us to pick up cancer at a stage when surgery is indeed a possibility. In this article by Cow in Nature and Medicine, the end of 2023, they developed also some algorithms. They had a deep learning approach with pancreatic cancer. They called it Panda. It trained on 3,000 cases from a single center very, very high accuracy for detecting pancreatic cancer, sensitivity 92.9, specificity 99.9. They showed that they were much better than the radiologists and outperformed the mean radiologist's performance by 34%. Now, of course, this was a little bit strange to me and to many of us. And the reason is this was non-contrast CT. All of us know that it's hard to detect early pancreatic cancer with contrast. Without contrast, oh my God. But they said they were able to do it, 99% specificity. Um, again, one can question their results. We'll see if it's reproducible. But again, it does make the point that early detection is indeed possible. Now, beyond detection, what about management? This was an article talking about managing patients with cystic pancreatic lesions. 97% of pancreatic cysts are IPMNs, which will cause no problem. Other patients can develop malignancy or high-grade dysplasia, and you would like to resect things early on to prevent the patient from getting cancer. On this study, they basically looked at about 860 patients, and it ended up that 40% of the patients who went to surgery needed surgery, and 60% actually had surgery, which is a distal pancreatectomy, or Whipple's for a benign lesion. Now, these weren't ex unexperienced physicians. These were top-of-the-line surgeons and GI folk. So now we're saying you only have 40% accuracy based on lab values and decision-making. This article by Berf Vogelstein and team called Comsist was able to do better. They were able to do 60% accuracy. Working with Microsoft and their explainable boosting machines, we were able to do far better than that. Now, these EBMs are very good for doing many things from heart disease to breast cancer, for example. And what we were able to do working with Juan Ferres and his team at Microsoft AI for Good Lab was be able to be much more specific how to manage the patients. You can see on a few of these charts, the predictions are substantially better than on the Compsist and surely on the patient management perspective, literally to the point that in about 90% of cases, we're able to be specific as to how the patient should be managed. In this model, where we did everything exactly the same as they did in the Comsys model. We did not add additional data. We did not reinterpret anything. But basically, they were able to avoid 92 unnecessary surgeries, a 59% in reduction of surgeries, and also other things. Again, sent 11 patients that needed surgery to surgery, which was an improvement, discharged correctly additional patients, and sent correctly to monitor other patients. So it improved things at every level, but the biggest level was avoiding unnecessary surgery. Now we have to see how that's going to play out as we look at larger data sets. Now, 
if he asks me, and in speaking to the audience, I'll say, look, where is AI in terms of ready for prime time? Forget pancreatic cancer. We're doing a lot of work. Hopefully it'll come soon. But PE detection, speak to people like Charlie White and Maryland routinely used. Breast imaging, more and more places are using it as a second reader. And musculoskeletal trauma is becoming more important. Here was an article from AI Doc, one of the uh, companies that has done very well with multiple solutions to multiple problems. And they basically looked at AI for interpretation of pulmonary emboli, looking at the gold standard and comparing. And they found high diagnostic performance of AI algorithms to diagnose PE. And one of the things that people have shown very nicely is that AI does not overcall the presence of PEs. And what it helps you, an obvious PE is an obvious PE, but it really helps you, especially when you're not sure is this real, is this artifact, you're kind of scratching your head. If AI says negative, people will just move on. So in this article by Ben Cheek, our work provides more scientific ground for the concept of AI augmented radiologists instead of supporting the theory of radiologists replaced by AI. No one is saying AI alone is reading the PE studies, but it's helping the radiologist. And key points, both the AI algorithm and ER docs showed excellent performance in diagnosing PE. The AI algorithm for PE can help increase the sensitivity and negative predictive value of emergency radiologists in clinical practice, especially in poor to moderate injection quality. What was especially amazing in this article was that when the study was a really high quality study, physicians and AI were about equal. But when the studies were not that good, AI was better than the radiologist. And emergency radiologists recommended the use of AI for PE detection and satisfaction surveys to increase their confidence and comfort in the final diagnosis. Three very important points, and three points that make you ask the question, why are you not using CT for PE in your institution? One of the things with AI, and again, I'm not of the school that AI is gonna make everybody unemployed, but what AI can do is make everybody an expert. It's been shown, okay, if you're the best in the world at doing something and you're 97% accurate, Okay, how much can AI help? Not much. But if you're at 70 or 75%, you're average or below average. You can make them like they're a professor, like they're an expert. So if you look at patients worldwide, nationwide, patients are the ones who are going to be benefiting from this. AI seems to be the great equalizer, improving the standard of care for diagnosis and treatment, improving the performance of the least experienced clinicians and make them closer to that expert level and improve the likelihood of a better outcome for our patients. Very, very important. Now, there are other things with pulmonary emboli and I wanna get back to that because I know we're running late and let me stop here and we'll come back and pick it up because this is a very important article because it makes you think about many things a little bit differently. So let's take a break and come back. I need to get a cup of coffee and we'll come back in five minutes. See you then. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.